had that instant occur. Um, uh, but what we say is going to just go out. Okay, so just be, bear that in mind. Um, okay, um, we're live, everybody. We're live, everybody. It is Founders Focus, episode eight, and I'm delighted to bring this show back. It's been kind of like a summer hiatus. We haven't done one of these for a couple of months, um, uh, but we've been waiting on to bring uh, these two gentlemen on ever since we kind of had the wonderful news that they uh, raised a, a, a significant round of funding to build out their uh, they're super interesting products. So um, uh, pleased to bring the show back with us. Um, a quick sound check before we kick off, though. Just want to make sure everyone can hear me okay. Again, we've got a, a new setup here, so potentially it could be dangerous. Um, folks on Crowdcast, if you can hear me okay, just let me know. That's um, uh, Yeah, you can hear me. Fantastic, Linda. Thank you very much. Uh, we are also uh, multicasting this on LinkedIn. Uh, so if you can hear me on LinkedIn, just give me some indication that I'm okay there um and also this is going live in facebook as well so just give me some sort of thumbs up that uh you can hear me okay okay we're gonna have a few yeses here it seems that we're, we're gonna be pretty good okay let's get on with it um let's first introduce these two folks so ben sessler uh sessler uh and uh, teddy chestnut um so let me uh, i want to throw it over to you ben can you quickly introduce yourself who you are what it is you do yeah i'm ben uh ceo and co-founder of bright hire and um, built Bright Hire after about 11 years, building other early growth stage companies and uh, spending some time in the talent and HR space at a company called CEB, Corporate Executive Board, which is now part of Gartner, doing uh, product development and strategy. Um, yeah, that's, that's the short, that's the short of my two little kids. Hung and I were talking about that. Uh, and we can talk about how it, it may or may not be uh, not advisable to start a startup with uh, a three-month-old baby. But we can get into that later. Um, yeah. Unless, unless one of your children ha happens to be an artistic genius, and if you just look behind Ben's left ear, you can see a bit of artwork there, which we're predicting is going to be like an NFT going to yeah. you know ridiculous value. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, okay, let's go to you, Teddy. Teddy, who are you? And what it is you do, sir? Uh, Teddy Chestnut, uh, co-founder of Bright Hire. I lead our go-to-market. Um, I'm the son of two longtime HR professionals, uh, both in, in the industry for like 30 years. So I guess I like, you know, fell into it. Uh, also started my career at CEB with Ben doing HR research, six and a half years at LinkedIn, lived in Montclair, New Jersey, two boys, five and seven, beautiful wife. Uh, I don't know. Those are the highlights. Fantastic stuff. Okay, let's just get into it. I mean, you two are running this business. Obviously, it's crazy time. So what did you two have to cancel in order for you to appear on Founders Folks today? Like what kind of like founder stuff were you planning to do in the hour or so we have? that You said, you know what, we have to put that on one side. We're going to speak to Hung and talk about this. Uh, what, what, was, what was meant to be happening today? Recruiting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Recruiting. That's, yeah, that's 100%. And you know what? It, it's a, it's a it's it's a kind of a rhetorical loop now, isn't it? But recruiting is so hard right now. Um, I don't know whether you guys are finding it, but no one can recruit anybody. It's like really, really remarkable. What, what is it you're recruiting for right now that you're struggling with um, for your team? I mean, we're we're hiring kind of across the board. So we're hiring on the engineering and product side, um, engineer, data science, uh, product, uh, product manager. Uh, we're hiring on the go to market side as well, uh, AEs and so forth. And we're hiring a lead recruiter uh, to, um, yeah, to, to be the first person, you know, full time within the company who's making sure that we uh, build a great team and run a great process and and uh, and kind of spearhead uh, all the other things that we're going to do from a TA perspective. You, you didn't tell me that. Um, that's actually really good news because everyone that kind of pays attention to brain food um, generally is a recruiter, I would imagine. So if you're, if you're potentially looking for work, folks, Bright Hire a Hiring. As, and it's the first job in, right? It's the first time you've hired an internal person to be the full-time head of talent for the company. Um, what an opportunity. I mean, if you fancy not only uh, recruiting for a cool tech company, but also a company that's building some cool recruiting tech, uh this is actually a really fantastic opportunity so um i'll be making sure that uh teddy i think you're the guy taking lead on this so i'll be making sure that people have your contact details after this and uh and if there's any uh, folks watching that are looking for uh, a shift of pace uh this could be something really interesting to investigate uh, okay um you two knew each other from before bright hype um you were work colleagues back in the day can you take us through a little bit about how 
sort of your early interactions occurred? I mean, were you working in the same team? Were you working as partners in some way? Did you play softball together or what? How did it kind of get to a point where, okay, we like each other and, you know, later on you rediscovered each other when you founded the business? Uh, I think Teddy came, well, I don't actually know how we met. Do you know how we met? I, it's hard to remember when you're six years old. Yeah. <laughs> I think Teddy came to my fifth birthday party or sixth birthday party. Uh, oh, you were you were childhood friends. I didn't yeah. know that. We grew, up, we grew up together. We went to yeah. school together from elementary school all the way through high school, and we knew each other from you know six from six years old. That's amazing. I don't think there's a. I, I don't think there's been any kind of instance that I know of where childhood friends have kind of gone on and in in and kind of dovetail back. Uh, to end up founding a, a business. That's amazing. Um, was there was there always a, some sort of indication when you were little boys that maybe you'd go on to do something together like this? Or was it, you know, just happenstance when you encountered each other professionally later on down the line? Yeah, we, you know, I definitely had my early entrepreneurial endeavors uh, when I was little, which, uh, but um, no, I, you know, it wasn't, Teddy and I weren't starting, you know, business together. We, were years old. Uh, we ended up, you know, we both ended up working in the same company, uh, CEB. Um, not, not a coincidence, you know, we became aware of it and kind of mentioned to Teddy that it was a really interesting place to go to study business, right? Uh, we were, we were researchers. I was, I was originally a researcher as well. Um, and it was a really, you know, close to my people. Um, and uh, during that time, uh, asked to help with uh, kind of a nights and weekends uh, startup, uh, different type of startup, but you know, two individuals were starting essentially a private equity fund um, in the media space and just needed some people to do a little bit of research to help them kind of get their business plan together and raise capital. And so Teddy and I actually did that um, on like nights and weekends for almost a year. Uh, and so we, we had actually worked together in that kind of capacity before and sort of knew under, kind of understood how we work together and, um, and so when we reconnected and thought, you know, we should start this company, it wasn't never spent that professional work time together. We had. So, yeah, yeah from we made a commitment to make sure that, like, our first office always had a window. And it was like, right here. <laughs> we were like going to this odd, like conference room with like no windows in it, and it was in the middle of Dupont Circle in DC, and like everybody would be out like partying at ten thirty at night, and Ben and I would be like cranking away on a PowerPoint deck. So we we've done the grind before. That's great. I mean, sometimes you need to know that, don't you? Uh, that it could be the wrong way. And, and maintenance and morale is so important when you're setting up uh, a business. Um, in, in terms of how you two operate, obviously, because you've got such long history, um, personally and professionally, um, uh, like you must know each other so well. Um, what is it that sort of you do, Ben, that Teddy doesn't? What does Teddy do that you don't? Um, functionally, we, we you know, kind of divide things like relatively cleanly. I tend to spend a lot more of my time on product and technology side, on the finance and operations side um, uh, of, what, of what we're doing. Uh, Teddy tends to focus more on the client side, uh, making sure our clients are super successful, the go-to-market side. Uh, and so it's a, it's a pretty clean split. And we kind of drew a Venn diagram before we started the company, uh, actually on, on good advice from, from actually our first investor. Um, to really formalize it and say like, you know, you're going to own these things. I'm going to own these things. Here's some things that are in the middle where we both need to agree. One of those being hiring, uh, to move forward. So that in itself is actually a real, um, kind of insight. Maybe the first bit of insight we've shared is that when you do have close connections between two people or even a, a number of people, you can oftentimes, um, not have a formal agreement because you feel like, hey, we know each other well, we're going to roll with it. But actually, you do need to write this down and document it and say, you know what, this is how we're going to move forward because there may be in future some sort of circumstance where, you know, those boundaries shift in some way. So um, I, I remember that actually being one of the problems in one of the very early businesses I set up with friends. Again, with friends, it was one of those where, you know, a lot of things were just unsaid because you assumed, um, yeah, of course, you know, we'd know how to roll with this, but there, there was a problem uh, or they emerged, uh, a problem became emergent um, that we didn't actually have formal agreement or even an escalation point to deal with it. Uh, so let's talk about the escalation point. What if there is a disagreement? Like, have you found out a way how to disagree 
Um, and what happens if, you know, Ben, you're saying banging the table for this and Teddy, you're saying no way is that happening? It needs to be resolved somehow. Like how, how do you, how do you sort that out? Is there, a, is there a mechanism to resolve the, uh, the disagreement? Ben, you know, yeah, 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 go for it. <laughs> so ben's much more likely to bang the table. I'm much more likely. Yeah, that's pretty realistic. I'll probably bang the table. Ben, ben, ben will bang the table. Um, yeah. I'm, I'll be more patient about it. And then I'll see if Ben wakes up the next day and feels how I feel. But sometimes he does, and sometimes he doesn't. Um, and if he doesn't, then oftentimes I've ended up on his side because he's had like a really good point that I didn't consider. But the but the rule is almost always like I got to sleep on it, like because you know just we process things in different ways. And like knowing Ben for thirty years, I know like how he processes new ideas. Sometimes it's like I got to sleep on it, uh, and so that's a, that's a one that I've like, you know, lived by as we made like difficult decisions together. You know what? That's the second bit of insight. If there is a fundamental dispute and people are very, very passionate one way or the other, maybe you need to like temporarily shift it. You like you may not be able to solve it at that moment, but you just agree. You know what? We're going to revisit tomorrow um, and then we'll talk about it again. And then obviously, if it repeats, you may use a different technique or a different instrument. But oftentimes you might find that, you know, you'll feel differently or you'll be able to look at it in a different way. Um, just giving it a, a bit of space of time. So, again, escalation. Like, How do you escalate and, and, uh, and, and find a way to disagree and still productively move forward without you know, potentially destroying the relationship? This is one of the problems, I think, in, in leadership and management in general that we don't actually train ourselves on how we disagree. Um, and oftentimes you get people that only know how to, dis to win, right? Only know how to completely uh, be victorious in every engagement. That can be very destructive, I guess. Ben, you were going to say something? Yeah, there's also a scale, I feel like a scale of conviction. So we've had disagreements where ultimately I'm like leaning towards one way, but I'm not a hard, you know, really hard in one direction. But Teddy might be extremely high conviction in the other direction. And I'll just say, look, I'm I I'm kind of leaning the other direction, but I but I'm I'm it's not hard conviction. And so if you have super hard conviction, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna just disagree with you on this, like, well, we can go that route because ultimately you feel like, it seems like you feel much more strongly than I do, even though I'm not necessarily completely sold. Are you two guys aware of a democratic way to measure conviction? Um, uh, so I was obsessed by this about a year and a half ago because I thought someone needs to build this tool. This is when everyone's in democratic crisis, right? And of course we still are. Um, and what I, what I think is happening is that people are making casual decisions um, where they don't care outcome, but they make an equal weight decision, which actually has profound impact on someone that really does care about this. Um, and it makes me feel like, you know what, the person that really, really cares probably should have like a, a heavier weight in this particular moment because it impacts them more directly. Um, and I started researching it and there's a thing called quadratic voting. Have you heard of this? No. It's, where, it's exactly... Where? It's exactly as what Ben described, but it's formalized. So in other words, you just allocate points to people. Uh, say, okay, Teddy, you got 100 points. Ben, you got 100 points. And when you vote, you can allocate how many points you care about this particular thing. But there's a finite fixed number of points. So you can't say 100 for everything because you say 10 for that. Then the next, next thing you talk about is 90 points, Ben. Um, you know, and the next time you vote on something else, and you can conserve your points. So actually, if you don't care about it that much, say, you know what? I'll let this one slide. I'll let this person who cares more talk about it because I want to reserve my points for stuff I really do care about. Yeah, um, that's, that's an interesting, it's an interesting model. I think one thing you'd have to keep in mind is who cares a lot about the outcome of that decision who doesn't get to vote, right? And like, how do you have somebody in the room or in the conversation representing that person, right? Right. Right. Uh, there's lots of, I mean, there's, there's lots of implementation problems with it. Um, uh, I, I think as a conceptual thing, it's worth playing around with. And I wonder whether tooling wise, we might be able to get there in some way. There's also an expertise kind of um, angle also. So in other words, you might care about something a lot, but maybe you don't know too much about it, Hong. Um, <laughs> you know, you need that's to have an That's the Venn diagram. Like That's right. Like, if someone cares about it and actually knows a lot about it, I'm prepared to say, you know what, this person right. should probably That's pay good. me better attention to this. You know, there's a great example of that. It's like you asked, you know, what, what Ben brings and, and and what I bring and what's different. And Ben talked about it from a functional perspective, but like from a, 
I don't know, just a way of operating perspective. Like Ben is much more thorough and rigorous and detailed when it comes to like planning stuff. So I'll throw out some like product idea that I think is cool. And Ben will then be like, yeah, but there's like these 19 edge cases that you haven't thought about. And so I might feel very like high conviction about something that I think is gonna be amazing, but I have learned to appreciate that like, you know, his perspective when he's actually done the three pages of a PRD on it and like understands, you know, all of the implications of all the other pieces uh, in the puzzle, like carries the day, right? And once in a yeah. while, I think that's good. Uh, but like that sort of balance matters a lot. You know what, all of these things go into the fundamentals of why we're all here. Like, how do we do hiring better? How do we actually improve the way in which we do it? We talked about, you know, the person who cares more, a person who's more competent, all of that feeds into actually how we hire and, and where the waiting is. So we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, let's kind of accelerate to the point where Bright Hire became like more than an idea. Um, where, can you give us the origin story of this? Was there some sort of traumatic recruiting episode that you encountered and you thought, oh my God, you know, someone got to fix this. Uh, where did, where did, how did this uh, idea happen? Yeah. Um, I mean, my, you know, sort of my side of the story, um, before Bright Hire, I was um, basically the COO, CFO of a data, a venture-backed data analytics company. Um, from about 15 people to you know 150 or thereabouts uh, over the course of you know a handful of years, and and my job was essentially help scale the company. I mean that that was actually you know ultimately the objective, and the most important thing I could do for that was hire. So I ended up hiring I don't know a third of the first hundred people personally, like sourced and, and hired. You know I, one of the hats I wore was over the HR and talent function, so um, just like really really hands on involved with scaling the organization, and when. I wanted to kind of move on and do something early stage again as, as we got to a little bit of scale, which I really enjoy the early stage. And I was thinking about what I was passionate about and where I want to spend my time. My head naturally went to, you know, I'm, I've always been very passionate about like the intersection between people and careers and people and organizations. I was a labor relations major, you know, in college. Uh, um, and so I just started ruminating on that and thinking about it. And a few observations I had were, you know, one, just like the best, some of the best people we hired, we were so close to not hiring for reasons that, you know, weren't, you know, there was just, you know, just extremely subjective reasons. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Two, you know, I was the CFO. So I was doing financial planning and I was involved in strategy. We were doing, you know, product development. And when I compared the data, the rigor, the decision making, like the collaborative decision making and all those things that went into, um, you know, executing those functions and then it compared it to hiring, it just felt like extremely mismatched because none of those functions actually run very well if you don't have the right people. So like people were the most important ingredient for our success. Um, hiring was the way that we built the team, but the process of hiring did not live up to its importance, you know, on those dimensions. Um, you know, and, you know, financially we would, you know, spend more time debating, you know, like some office sublease and like how much we should spend on it than, you know, somebody who's going to join our data science team. And that was the person was going to have orders of magnitude, more impact and orders of magnitude, more costs. Uh, and it just seemed like there was a disconnect and thinking back to all the tools I'd been pitched as a CFO, sort of signing checks for what we bought or in my corporate development role at CV, where I looked at a lot of HR tech, it, it struck me that, you know, almost everything we had looked at was at the top of the funnel. It was like to find a candidate, to source a candidate. And that stuff was really important. But it was like, huh, this is like a black box. There's like not as much data and collaboration as there is in any other function. And it's the most important thing that just like struck me as odd. And I never really thought about it that way before. And uh, yeah, I just reached out to Teddy, just like I reached out to him, you know, about a lot of things like, you know, movies I like or what have you. But I was like, hey, Teddy, I had this thought today. Uh, and I thought might he, maybe he'd appreciate it given his you know kind of deep background in the space. And, you know, like he, he can pick it up from there, but that, yeah. I mean, the problem statement resonated with me, like both personally and the context of when I was at LinkedIn. I was working with like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs and J&J, massive talent acquisition organizations. And every single one of the outcomes that they were trying to drive toward, right? The right hiring decisions, a great candidate experience, a fast mission process was all driven by a series of conversations that, you know, the head of talent acquisition had literally no visibility into at all. I remember one conversation where the head of a, 13,000 person company was like, I don't even, if you really push me, I don't even really know what questions we ask candidates in interviews. So like, how, how could he actually, like there's no visibility. Yep. 
So there was this like, you know, this hunger for data and insight and rigor around the process, but there was this massive black box, it felt like in the middle of it. And I was perceiving that in the role, you know, working with those teams. And then I perceived it just personally as a hiring manager. Like I had moved from a selling role to leading a data analytics team. I was hiring for a leader on that team and I had candidates speak with multiple people on the panel. And I spoke with like senior execs and people who I thought very highly of and we got back into a debrief and I got feedback like, you know, I don't think that she'd be a good culture fit. And it's like, that that's, that's I can't make a decision based on that. Like what happened, what did you ask? What happened? And like the lack, you know, that, inter that interview had happened last week and they didn't have good notes and they, they couldn't give me much. That just felt like a massive disservice to the candidate in that process. It made me feel like I was standing on very shaky ground trying to make a, a really important call and just felt like there had to be a better way than gut, feel, memory, games of telephone, pen and paper. Um, and it was very clear that, you know, technology was solving similar kinds of problems in, in other parts of the business. Um, and you know what, guys, um, a, a lot of people are listening to this. Um, this might be a revelation to them because I think the entire industry um, has kind of accepted that the interview itself would kind of be a black hole. We, we never considered um, that there should be more information available to other people who weren't actively present in the process. We just assumed, how, how, how could it otherwise be? Um, uh, but of course, that's problematic because we know there's bias going on in there. We know time of day matters when someone does an interview. We know like the interview frequency has an uh, impact and like how, how energetic someone is. Like uh, the, the, if their sort of energy goes down, they're likely to be a poorer interviewer and that's gonna lead to poorer decisions and verdicts going on down there. And the, the business has no clue. <laughs> it's literally exactly as you described, Teddy. The hiring manager comes out the room and says, that person wasn't strong enough. And it's like, what can you do? Like, you can't then over, or you don't have any tooling or any data to, to over, over, yeah. over uh, come that uh, situation. So yeah. um, go ahead. I was just saying the, the cost is just massive. Right? The, the cost of like making the wrong call is massive. The cost to the candidate of being on the receiving end of a process that you know wasn't professional or fair is massive. The recruiting operations cost is massive. Right? Like when you kick a candidate out at the end of the process who would have otherwise been qualified and now you're going back and sourcing and screening and scheduling and like spinning all those flywheels, it just seemed like to Ben's point, like all this investment was being made at the very top of the funnel or in trying to like automate some relatively small low value task in the process. But when you thought about like what actually drove the most important outcomes, what actually drove the most amount of time in the process, it was getting the conversations right. So uh, for the folks who don't know, um, how would you like describe Bright Hire? What is the product? Like, what does it do? It's a lightweight interview platform that records and transcribes conversations to make them searchable, shareable and analyzable. So recruiters and hiring teams can actually work together to make confident hiring decisions deliver a great candidate experience and run an equitable process. You know what? I call it a interview analytics platform. Is that something that, is that a term that you would agree with or have, 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 would, I, would that characterization not feel comfortable for you guys? We use interview intelligence. Um, and I think the thing that I, I like to underscore and why interview analytics, I think is, is one way to describe what we're doing, but I don't think it's kind of a fully descriptive term is there are a bunch of really powerful analytics um, that we can produce that speak to equity and quality of the process that help drive change, improvement. But we want to deliver value in every conversation, in every, you know, in every decision, in every process, on every team. And that we show up every day. People are doing interviews on Bright Hire every day. They're going back and revisiting something to make sure that they give the right feedback or that it's fair. They're calibrating with their hiring manager or the hiring managers calibrating with the recruiter every day to make sure that they're talking about real people in their own words and not just like ideas and you know represents representations of people on the page and so the analytics is a really important part of what we do but we actually just show up day in and day out and like make the process work better um and make the process work faster make it uh, make people more well calibrated help them make the right decision uh, a very important decision so yeah um a skeptic, put my skeptic hat on. Um, I might say, okay, a hiring manager may not welcome this type of product because, hey, 
am I being like surveyed by uh, by, by the talent acquisition guys here? Is, is is HR like looking at how I interview? Get out of here! I don't want this. Um, have you encountered that objection or that conversation with some of your customers? And how have you uh, aided, I guess, the TA teams to overcome those those types of objections? So far, the product has overcome those objections. Meaning, there are, you know. There's always people who are a skeptic of any behavior change. Just you're asking somebody to do something. We don't actually ask anyone to do anything new, but you know, it, it's a new element in the process. And so, so frequently, uh, in fact, in almost every th case I can think of, there's like a group, a team that's like, hey, I don't know. And then they're the biggest champion. Uh, they end up being like the biggest champion because they value the data-driven nature of how they can actually assess candidates. They value the equity. And like the combination of it's really convenient for interviewers um just like makes their life easier and people universally appreciate delivering a fair process i mean uh and and, and feeling like it's more evidence-based and less subjective and 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 better for the candidate and and those two things are front and center in the value that every end user gets to the product and so um yeah the, those those sentiments tend to disappear very quickly and people like get their hands in the product and use it a few times and think, oh, wow, this is actually quite convenient for me. Yeah, actually, I can imagine it will take a little bit of the admin load off hiring managers anyway, because it does the auto transcription. It, it, you know, presumably that's shared data within the TA team. So it takes away the need for the hiring manager to come out with uh, feedback internally, for instance. Um, you can, there's a lot of information kind of already there um that will kind of remove a few unnecessary conversations that otherwise might have happened so it really does a good job right people want to feel confident like they're doing a great job in the hiring in the interview process and the hiring process and it's not something that everyone was you know trained formally to do and and it's a really hard task you know you're saying hey jump into this conversation with this person remember who they are what role it was and the seven things that you should ask them pay really close attention and like drill in and probe, but also like write down lots of things that they're telling you so that you have great notes and you can remember who they are because you know, I remember we forget 44% of the things uh, in a conversation an hour later. So you have to write lots of things down so you remember. And then three or four or however many days later, go back, recall everything and make an unbiased decision. That's well cal calibrated against all these other people that you've talked to that you have to remember. That's very hard. Um, yeah. That's exactly, why technology exists is to help people do something better. Um, and people feel it when they use the product, they feel more equipped to do this thing that most people think is really important and um, and feel more confident about doing it. The, the product makes sense um, the more you talk about it. Um, when did it became, what, rewinding back to when you were building this thing, um, what was the the early roadmap? What did that look like? So you and Teddy had this conversation. You said, you know what? Yeah, this is a problem that needs to be fixed. Um, uh, did you uh, sort of have a very clear idea as to what you needed to do before you moved out? Did you think, right, I, we need to get this amount of early investment. We needed to build this type of prototype. Like, was it absolutely clear in your mind or was it more like fumbling your way forward um, as you were, as you were you know, trying to figure out uh, the business side of it as well as the product? I mean, the first thing we did was we talked to a bunch of people. I mean, it's like the first step. We were like, this seems like it makes all the sense in the world. And Penny and I had lots of, you know, we had our own experiences in the space. Uh, so we weren't sort of like novices and new to the world of TA. So uh, we, we felt like we understood it, but we still went out and then talked to, you know, 20, 30 folks uh, who are, you know, former clients of Teddy's, you know, who are leading TA at some of the biggest companies in the world. You know, people in my network who are more in the mid market or growth stage, heads of people and heads of talent, and just you know talk through the problem statement and what we thought uh, might be really an interesting solution, and kind of validate that people were like, "Yeah, that makes a tremendous amount of sense," and it seems like it could be really valuable. Uh, and then you know, from there, it was around, okay, so how do we take the validation to the next step? And that, that meant you know, build something that people can use. Uh, and start delivering on a value proposition and, and making sure that, you know, when it's in people's hands, it it creates value. And so, yeah. you know, sort of a sprint to create a prototype. Uh, I think one, one thing that was like really important to me from the outset was like having been in this space and seeing a bunch of product built that didn't work, usually it didn't work because it didn't work for recruiters. It didn't work 
in their workflows. It didn't meet them where they were. It didn't do a specific job for them. And obviously, like, recruiters are not the only stakeholders in the hiring process. There's interviewers and hiring managers, and we also serve talent acquisition leaders. But from the very beginning, Ben and I were pretty adamant that the, the platform had to create value for recruiters. It needed to be in their workflows. It needed to do a job for them. Uh, and so in addition to talking to a lot of talent acquisition leaders, we talked to a lot of recruiters. Like, how do you do your job? How do you take notes? It's like, what are the things that slow you down? What gets you frustrated? And you start to hear, you know, these little snippets, like a recruiter saying, you know, one of the things that's really challenging, I'm working with 20 different recs and I've been talking to 50, you know, candidates and I pass one through to a hiring manager and she comes back to me with a question about like something very specific. Like, why did that candidate leave that job two jobs ago? And having this moment of like, this is my moment to be a partner with that hiring manager. I know we talked about that. I don't have it in my notes. It. Yep. I don't have it. So now I got to go, you know, email that candidate or call them, and that's going to be three days. And like, how often does that happen? Oh, like four times a week. Like, oh, okay. How do we like solve that problem for the recruiter? Like a, a moment of delight or a moment of frustration that we can alleviate. So we're to really attuned to that that user, like the recruiter, as a really important stakeholder for us. You know what, that's a really important point to make because uh, too many times that vendors fail to understand that the person buying the software may not be the most active user of the software. Um, and you end up building for the buyer of the software, which is all well and good, but then you have a utilization problem because that person's bought it. Guess what, he just told his team, hey, we're using this. And the team is like, yeah, it doesn't quite work according to how I need to work. So that yeah. balance, I think it's great that you identified that early. Um, and that you needed to get both of those stakeholders like very clear in your mind as you're building the product. Um, there was there was that recruiter stakeholder. There's like the, there's the interviewer. Like I interview once every quarter, right? So I'm not going to learn a new platform. I'm not going to change my behavior. So like, how do we ensure that that person has a seamless, beautiful experience on the platform? And then how do we think about like other really important stakeholders, like uh, the recruiting ops lead or the recruiting coordinator, right? Somebody who's doing a ton of scheduling and has already built like their version of the best way to operate, you know, for their team. How do you not disrupt that? Right? How do you not create friction for that? So like each of those stakeholders, we tried to think really kind of thoughtfully, look, we couldn't build for all of them all at once at the outset, but with every product decision we've made, it's been, how do we ensure that we serve those different stakeholders in a beautiful way? When did you realize you had a working prototype? Like, was there a moment where, so you're hacking away, you spoke to all these people, at what point did you think, you know what, we could throw it into this, these three companies here um, and, and and see how they go? Uh, or were you blase with it? Were you like really aggressive to say, they're going to tell us whether it works or not, just throw it at them. Um, like, how did you make that decision? Oftentimes founders are a little bit shy about this part because um, they want to obviously, you know, have a beautiful product already. They want to, uh, you know, over perfection mentality. How did you beat that? And how did you chuck it into, uh, uh, how did you identify the, the first person to use it? Boom, who's that? I'm smiling because we probably were pretty proud of the fact that we had a prototype that worked at the time. It was like insanely, insanely bare bones. Uh, we're like, Look, it works. Um, I think we were just, you know, we were still, we never stopped being in, we still haven't stopped being in just a constant learning cycle. So we're always just talking to people with no agenda, just, you know, here, this is what we're working on. What do you think? And we were sort of, sort of still in that cycle. And eventually we are in that cycle and we had something to show people. And there are, you know, if, I think it resonated, you know, someone was like, yeah, this is a great idea. Oh, that's cool. And we are like, would you be willing to use it? Uh, and that, I think, you know, it was as simple as that, you know, I think the yeah. first people are, were buying with their time. They're not, they weren't buying with dollars because your people's time is their most limited resource. Uh, and so if somebody even willing to take your product and put it into their workflow and do something different than they're doing today, that's like actually asking for them to do something pretty significant. And so we weren't necessarily, you know, charging dollars on day one, you know, at all. And and we didn't, that wasn't the expectation. It was, hey, are you willing to put this into your workflow and start using it and tell us what you think? Um, yeah. From those early uh, users who I'm sure you've got sort of good memories of, um, you'll never forget the first type of companies that use the product. Um, what did they teach you that, you, that surprised you? Um, was there any kind of behaviors that they got involved in and you thought, oh, I didn't actually anticipate that? I'm trying to think of something sort of strategic and not extremely tactical. Uh, just like weird edge cases. Tactical where, stuff is like the most valuable. Um, yeah. Like, what if they missed the call? Like, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> okay. right. well, you can, well, you know what, you can send them a text and then we'll reroute, you know, just like all sorts of little edge cases that you learn. Um, I don't know, I feel like, yeah, it's a mix of a lot of little things and then there's patterns that emerge out of them, you know, where a bunch of those things add up to delivering a great candidate experience or being really seamless or how somebody, you know, wants to collaborate and calibrate constantly with their hiring manager or vice versa. Um, and sort of like trends emerge around that. But I think just generally speaking, we've, we were trying to be, we've been trying to be, and, and we're very early, like laser focused on what Teddy talked about before, just like not disrupting people's work though, you know, uh, just like being as simple as possible in terms of the way people work. Uh, in every, you know, in every place that we could, you know, um, and be, be just like seamlessly embedded in the tools that they're already using and try not to make them go do a bunch of other stuff that, you know, may create value, but is asking them to do something, you know, like different from what they're doing today. I think one learning, and I wish I had like really learned it on the first rep, I think it probably took a couple more for us to like really internalize it is people won't, people have a difficult time explaining the complexity of their workflows to you. There's all these things that are true about their setups and environments that they take for granted that, you know, influence how you need to build a product to be seamless. Um, and so doing the right discovery with them up front to really understand like, oh, you have a VoIP line and you use extensions and like, we haven't even thought about that. Like those sorts of things, you know, just getting into the weeds with clients, especially the early ones matters a ton. That's right. I think the clients are not going to have like at the front of their mind, like how they have built their own systems or processes. It's gone into their subconscious or, you know, it's something that they've just copy pasted from the previous business they're in. And it's already, this is how they roll out a template. Um, and they don't consciously think about that. So you have to almost, uh, you know, help them dig through it and say, okay, here's the step-by-step, -step, uh, uh, process that we have to go through. Yeah. Um, and the UX, you know, like the classic UX research approach, which is just, Hey, can you just like open your share your screen and just show me how you do something? Is that there's nothing that's better than that because then people are doing all the things that they would do inter, you know intuitively that they don't have to like categorize and frame for you in their mind. They just show you and then you say, oh, what? interesting, and then you copy that. Oh, and then you you keep those four tabs open. That's interesting, and you just learn a lot about people's behavior that way. You know, you both mentioned that you know the building of Bright High was all about trying to just slip in to how this person normally works. It shouldn't be an additional thing, which is fantastic um, for everyone concerned. Um, but is there a way to like misuse Bright High? Have you have you spotted like somebody who's like implementing and you think no 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 <laughs> don't don't do it like this? Uh, is there is have you spotted any like behavior of that type? And is that worth talking about? I feel like people have used the product and then been like, I could also use this for this other different use case. Like, have you considered selling to, to this whole different function? Because there's some fundamentals of, you know, what we built that are, again, like very convenient, very, they induce collaboration, they create alignment and transparency and the ability to work together quickly. And, you know, those have been, that, those things have been brought up a lot. And, you know, our answer has generally been like, yeah, I guess you could use this product, you know, in a different realm potentially, but we're passionate about this realm. And we have to build, we're building this business because this is the problem that we want to solve, like personally, you know, and so that's interesting, but, you know, we're going to keep applying this technology to this problem because this is the, this is what we want to do. And this is, you know, we get energized out of solving problems in this space. It's what we care about. So, um, you know, that's definitely come up where people are like, Hey, I could point this at this other, yeah. this other case altogether in the company. And we're, you know, like that. Yeah. Theoretically, but that's not what we're focused on. You know? That's it. You get to the the over enthusiastic customer, don't you? Who's constantly like that. That's the person that's always like in your uh, product feature request uh, sort of uh, lines. They're constantly piping in with like genius ideas as to what you should do next. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That's the best. Um, um, okay, let's have a look at sort of the uh, where you're at with customer base. I mean, you, you've deployed it. It's out there. You're a live business, growing business. Um, what kind of companies seem to be embracing this more than others? Have you spotted a pattern there at all? Yeah, I mean, the shortcut is like unicorns, like super fast growing mid market companies that are trying to scale their teams and scale their interviewing capacity without sacrificing quality. Um, yeah, yeah, so, very, very good. So that's, I mean, all, probably the best type of customer, right? They've got all, all themselves on a growth curve also themselves typically like innovation friendly let's say exactly. um and uh, they, uh, uh, they they obviously have the 
uh, the, the requirement and all the, the, the funds to use it uh, to, to, to purchase the product. So that's fantastic um, yeah. type of business to work with. Yeah, all, all true. And I think the, you know, the nature of the, or the, the kind of talent acquisition leader that we're working with, you know, matters a lot. The, I don't know, the Hannah Spellmeyers or Bed Campers of the world who, you know, are forward thinking and have always been strategic partners for their business, have been resourced in that way, um, and are really committed to like elevating their teams and their function. Um, yeah, those are the people who are working with Peta. How how important do you think the the pandemic has been to the journey for you guys? Um, obviously, you set the business up, started the you know the ideation of it way before um, the, the the crisis hit, um, but clearly the world of work has changed huge talk conversation now about shift to remote shift to remote is also like a digitization of previously analog processes particularly the interview actually um so how great an impact do you think uh, COVID 19 has, ha has had for your your business in particular it's definitely had a bit i mean a pretty big impact we, we, look we started the business well before um just because we believe that there was so much value in even the level of conversations that we're having having over phone or video you know, even if it was only the first three stages of the process, there's a tremendous amount of value in calibration up front, speed up front, decision, you know, in, informing the right decision, you know, can't going down the pipe. But of course, there's been a massive behavior change over the past, you know, um, year and a half um, where, you know, it's funny, I talked to one of our clients recently um, and we were talking about, you know, their plans from a hiring perspective. And she was sort of saying, there is just no way we could move with the speed and with the efficiency and do the amount of hiring that we're doing if in an old world, right? We're like bringing people in and we're trying to fit people in the conference rooms and all that. And so, you know, the behavior change around that, the behavior change around just people being much more comfortable hiring, hiring this way and realizing it doesn't actually make a difference at all for the quality of people they're hiring, how well they get to know them. And particularly with tools like ours, you know, they, they almost know them deep more deeply um, because they can go back and revisit and like actually, you know, uh, make sure that they they turn over all the stones they need to turn and really understand people before they make these really important decisions. So it's it's, it's had a big impact for sure. You do wonder, like I, I think we're we're close, maybe a year away from looking back on the before time, so to speak, and we just one like we'll be puzzled as like why the hell did, did no one ever think about that? Like the problem of meeting rooms, how how big a friction was that in recruiting? Um, probably massive, right? <laughs> was, like, whole, yeah, I mean, there's whole companies that are, exist because that was such a you know. It's, that's a, it was so problematic, right? Yeah, um, amazing. So have you guys spotted any sort of difference in terms of how interviews actually take place? Like, for instance, have they got shorter as a result of everyone being more comfortable with video? Uh, is there a trend that they are reducing in terms of time? Are we doing more interviews per candidate? Are we doing less? Is there any, like, patterns that you can spot and say, you know what, maybe that's a, a trend that we've got to keep an eye on? I mean, they're just the velocity and the speed with which a process is running is increasing dramatically. Like, there's no question. You know, the time between interviews is shrinking dramatically. You know, it, you previously you might have been spaced over three weeks uh, or more, right? Uh, by the time someone does the first conversation, let's set them up next week with this person. Now that, I mean, you know, we're seeing folks get hired uh, in a matter of days, and it's not like it's only one conversation. You know, they're, they're having, you know, almost like a full, you know, a full interview. Um, you know, run, but it's happening over the course of two and a half days. You know, talking to this person today, that person tomorrow, and three people the following day. Uh, maybe not all, and maybe not all consecutively. Maybe, you know, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one later, whenever people are available. But that time is shrinking very, very dramatically. And it's also by necessity because, you know, there's so much competition for you know, certain, you know, certain types of talent uh, that people need to move quickly and they recognize that, but they're also able to do it. So that's definitely something that we've seen. Yeah, fantastic. Um, what about the um, uh, a question I want to ask here is uh, sort of, and this may be different in different jurisdictions, it will be different in different jurisdictions, um, privacy. Um, certain people might be saying, okay, um, you're recording my interview. Um, uh, maybe I need to have access to that transcription. Um, what is the policy for Bright Hire here? Do you provide that? Um, do you uh, do you delete uh, on on the candidate request? Let's say, how long do you keep the data? Can you uh, give us a bit of an overview as to where you guys are at with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I mean, sure. I mean, no, go for it. I would say it starts with like our first value as a company is candidates first. So like every product decision we make 
starts from the vantage point of how are we doing right by candidates. Um, it's also, of course, informed by, as you mentioned, like the policies and the jurisdictions which we operate. We operate in the EU under GDPR. A candidate absolutely has to consent to be recorded, has the right to you know, be forgotten, has the right to request access to the information about them you know, in their dossier. And so like, we uphold all of those, of course. We have you know, companies that work uh, in the US, in the EU, in Asia, and so you know, we comply with all of that for sure. Um, but we think about it, you know, first and foremost, not for, as a compliance question, but as like a what's the right thing to do by candidates. Yeah, very, very interesting. Um, and I think the attitude of candidates will differ in ju different jurisdictions also. Um, so it'd be interesting to spot the behavior that goes on and whether that impacts your product decision making at some point, whether that complicates your uh, roadmap in some way where you meet, need to you know, significantly localize the product for, for, for the culture or the, the, the environment, or do you stick with, you know, hopefully a universal system, obviously a product maker wants to, you know, create one tool rather than have different versions of. So it'd be fascinating to see how that challenge uh, kind of meets itself. Um, what about sort of all this data you're collecting? Somebody's going to say, yo, you could probably do some really interesting prediction stuff now. Um, like, you know, can, can, we, can we mine this information, you know, create some sort of predictions going on? Is that a direction you want to go in or do you think, you know what, that's going to head down a road that is going to just be ethically problematic and, you know, potentially it's just going to be uh, a whole load of problems that, uh, that we're putting into in store for ourselves. Where, where are you, what, where's your thinking on that? I think generally we want to enable companies to do, A, just understand what's happening in their hiring process in a way that they're unable to today. So what are the inputs? Like, what, what are we actually assessing for? How is the process run? Are we doing a, a great, a good job, a, a fair job, uh, and so forth? And then by doing that, you're able to drive improvement, right? So part of driving improvement is understanding what's happening and, and focusing on it. The other way to drive improvement is to then try to map what's happening to outcomes and then make changes that hopefully help you get better and better over time. And so I think we're really excited about that opportunity, but we're also very, very cautious about the way that we do it, right? Because you know we. Um, you know, we don't apply um, AI or, or machine learning to make a decision about who you should hire, which is not something we do. Um, what we do is apply a bunch of technology to equip people to make hopefully the best decision possible in a way that they aren't able to before because we don't have perfect memories and, you know, and all of those things. And so uh, ultimately, that's definitely something that we are exploring, but more insofar as we understand, you know, what leads to successful outcomes. Uh, you know, hiring the right people that are, uh, you know, successful over the longer term in our organization. And then how do we try to map that back to the way that we run the process? Um, you know, certain things that we assess for or certain ways that we run, uh, you know, the process, you know, so that, that's really something that we're quite excited about. Um, but again, we're, we're, we're always very, uh, try to be very thoughtful and, and a bit cautious about, you know, the, like the limitations of where the technology is. And then you're not having any negative impact on individual candidates or things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, I think the um, what would be interesting, and this kind of leads on to you know what the the future roadmap might look like is you know are you are you mapping the assessment? Uh, and I know you don't do candidate assessment per se; it's more like interviewer assessment, right? I mean, you want the 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 focus is actually improving the interviewer rather than doing anything with regards to assessment of candidate. But inevitably, you'll pick up data uh, that might be able that might be mappable to employee performance at some time um, so you might say you know what uh, this person got interviewed in our system he's like a great performer in our in this company um, the, the customer might be interested to see whether there's a pattern there um, is that a direction of travel that potentially you want to go down to map sort of the information or the data you're collecting at the assessment to you know how the person ends up performing in the in the company? Yeah, I mean, one thing you hear is, you know, there are things about like technical hiring, for example. Folks will be like, there's a couple engineers on our team who are like canaries in the coal mine. Like when they interview and they say yes, that candidate turns out to be amazing. When they interview and say no, that candidate doesn't pan out. What's happening in those interviews? Like what are they asking and what what are they intuiting from those conversations that lead them to have high signal judgment on candidates? Be able to understand what a great, you know, what they perceive as a great answer to a question, or how they probe more deeply, and then be able to spread that is incredibly powerful. Again, like right now, it's a black box. You don't know. All you know is that this person happens to have good judgment or signal. 
Um, let's be able to really uncover that and then help everybody on the hiring team get better. You think about how much of a lift that can create with respect to interviewer capacity or moving bottlenecks. And also just thinking about the, the leadership across that entire team, like how people develop in their careers understanding how to hire and assess talent really effectively is a really foundational part of what it means to be a great leader. And so if you can help people actually get better at assessing talent by understanding how the people who are already great at it are doing it really well, like that's super helpful for everybody on the team. Yeah, fantastic. Um, let's talk about that uh, product roadmap. What, what, are, what are your customers got to be excited about over the next uh, 12 months? I mean, do you have things that you can say, yeah, look out in November, this is going to be dropping. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what stuff are you rolling out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think one of the big areas that we are continuously investing in is uh, it's two pronged. One is there's a lot of important context in, in interviews. I mean, that's kind of foundational to our business, that really important things transpire between people that should shape the process and outcomes. And we see that in our own data. We see the frequency with people. People go back and revisit the conversations, the frequency with pe which people collaborate. It's, it's remarkably high. And so we're, we're using technology to now extract moments of that matter from those conversations in a very intelligent way and then building them seamlessly into the way people hire so that we can increase how often people are going back to real substance to replace subjectivity because we know that ultimately is going to have uh, a big outcome for them and better decision making for the speed of the process and on the candidate we want candidate decisions to be based on substance not subjectivity so we're doing a whole bunch of things uh, that are quite intelligent to really basically is, you know figure out what's important in the conversation and bubble those things to the top and make them really accessible and then building a bunch of you know really powerful integrations so that it's like right in the flow of someone's work. They don't have to like remember to go find it. Uh, that, that's gonna have a, a huge impact. Um, so that's one on the analytics side, that, that's another. So a lot of things that we talked about were, were doubling down on how people can essentially measure the equity of their hiring process. And that means you know, how consistent are we uh, on a bunch of different dimensions and how can, you know, and how does that apply to applicants versus internal referrals, different types of candidates across teams, and then measuring, you know, the quality uh, of our process. You know, we know from our system, like what the game plan is for an interview loop for every interview. And so we can measure how well the game plan is followed. Uh, ultimately, a lot of time and attention was spent to, to build that out because it matters because, you know, it's important to have a thoughtful plan. And so being able to measure whether the plan is followed and how consistently and where there are opportunities for improvement is really important. So there are two things that are, you know, we, we already have, but we're, we're kind of doubling down on that, you know, we're really excited about. We think they're going to create a tremendous amount of value. Um, and we're able to serve not just to, you know, individuals to help them get better, but we're actually serve it to folks in, you know, talent leadership and so forth, to just help them understand, like have their finger on the pulse of a hiring process and their function in a way that was like sort of unimaginable before. Uh, to drive really important change. Um, we have you know, really cool stories already of, you know, just talent leaders uncovering things and driving changes that are just like, otherwise would have been complete black box. And it's really, you know, it's gonna shape their ability to, you know, hire great talent. Um, and and so, yeah, we're, we're super excited about those things. Yeah, and that's how the product becomes like a, a, a vital tool for that person um, because it gives them access to information they just wouldn't have, um, information that helps them guide decisions that are going to be super important. So um, I think absolutely sort of your investment in, 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 in the product in those areas is very much mapped to their emotional investment in terms of what they need. So that sounds yeah. fantastic. Yeah, think about like the, again, like going back to the persona of the recruiter, right? we're building a lot for them. You know, recruiter's job in large part is you know, deliver a great candidate experience and shepherd that candidate through every part of the process through to an accepted offer. There's so much that happens in the conversations that the recruiter's not in that influence that candidate's trajectory. To be able to surface for a recruiter across then the, the next three, four, five conversations that the candidate has, when important things have come up, what questions has that candidate asked? Or did they talk about having a competing offer? Or do they mention something about their motivations that didn't come up in the recruiter screen? That are really important for that recruiter as they then develop the, the pitch or the offer or rally that team to get that candidate over the line uh all of a sudden to be able to like seamlessly create a you know digest of those key highlight moments for that recruiter like empowers them to manage that process in a really beautiful way um, yeah and and the outcome but also at the, at the front lines as well 
That's right. And the outcome of all of this should be a better candidate experience. It should be a fairer candidate experience, but it should just feel better um, because you've yeah. got just more attentive uh, sort of uh, uh, employer. They know more and they cut the more thorough and shorter amount of time. Um, you know, so, so a lot of companies, again, in the before times, uh, mistook doing loads of interviews for being thorough. Um, so, uh, but they end up just asking the same stuff and the candidate gets like totally frustrated because they've answered the same question over and over again. It's like, well, what are you doing? Um, and it's, 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 it's a Venn diagram of like seven overlapping circles. Um, and there's really not actually that much surface area across them. That's exactly right. Um, okay, we've only got five minutes left, uh, 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 Teddy and Ben. So let's 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 focus on um, sort of where you guys are at in terms of a business. Like, how do you win going forward? What does winning look like? Um, uh, do you have like a, a sort of a, an end game where you think, boom, we, we've we've done this? Um, what, and if so, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, one one version of winning for me, so to speak, uh, is actually like a story that's in my head, which is. You know, a candidate comes to a career, you know, a career page for a company that we really respect. And it, you know, it says that, hey, we use Bright Hire. And the candidate thinks to themselves, awesome, terrific. Like they care. They're invested. They're invested in the process. And by, by extension, I, I believe that they're invested in like people that they and the team they're building. And that makes them like super excited to to want to join that company. Like that's actually a version of success for me that I think sales, there's a lot wrapped into that. It's like how we treat candidates. It's the value we create for companies. It's, it's you know, the fact that we're working with great, great, you know, great organizations. But like that, that story happening and happening over and over again, that that's like winning for me because you know, at the, at the end of the day, it's about transforming this like really important part of people's lives, um, both like their experience as a candidate, but also like the people that you end up spending your all day long with at work, right? Like that's a big part of your life, and having them be the right people and. Uh, and a great fit and, and help your organization grow. So um, like that, that would be sort of winning for me uh, in a nutshell. Great. How about you, Teddy? What does a uh, version of victory uh, uh, sound like to you? I mean, one of the things you align on very early is the mission and the vision and what you're trying to accomplish. I think Ben really summed it up. <laughs> like, you know, the opportunity to create value for, uh, for every candidate in a really important moment of potential inflection in their personal and professional career. That's huge to bring quality, professionalism, rigor, consistency, fairness, fundamentally into those interactions, you know, into all of them. When I think about Bright Hire, you know, we get to create value at the like atomic level of every interview. Whether you're a two-person startup hiring your first person, or you're you know JP Morgan and you're hiring you know tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people a year, we can create value for for all of those organizations, and so. You know, the aspiration is to do that. Yeah, I, mean, I was talking to one of our clients very quickly, uh, a C level, uh, uh, C level executive at one of our clients. In first thirty days in the you know on our platform, I said, you know, tell me, you know, tell me a story, like what what's happened, what, what do you think? And she told a story about literally hiring somebody on her team that she otherwise wouldn't have hired. There was like a split plan. All a deputy was, you know, a thumbs down, and she was able to go back, understand what the issue was, realize it was like a miscommunication and a non issue, and now. That person has a job they wouldn't have had otherwise. She has someone on her team that wouldn't have been on her team otherwise, not the right fit. They would have been still searching. Like multiple lives were changed, right? Because there was some context available. Uh, now magnify that times, you know, hundred million. You know, that's that's amazing. That's you know, that's why you get out of bed in the morning. Yeah, and fundamentally, another way to think about bright hire is that it it will increase the confidence in the hiring team to make the decision. Like oftentimes there is a doubt, but is the doubt a rational doubt? Uh, is it because they just simply haven't covered, you know, sometimes an interview is poorly executed. You haven't covered the information, but you're embarrassed or you don't have the time to go back or whatever. And it's a default. No, because, you know, you messed up your interview. Um, so with a tooling like this, actually, you've already captured a lot of the value um, that uh, that otherwise wouldn't be there in w what was previously only two years ago was the completely analog process. Like, um, you know, two years ago. I would say close to 100% of interviews were entirely analog. It was two, three people in a room, one of them making notes on paper usually. Um, and that was it. That was that was what, it, what happened. So uh, now we have an entirely new world. And it is fantastic from my side to see sort of these emergent products creating in these new categories um, and attacking uh, you know, these hidden problems that perhaps 
you know, we didn't know we're, there were just like these sores that were that were in the recruiting process that we just didn't realize how to solve for it. Um, so fantastic that you uh, you two are there. Okay, well, we're at the end of time, uh, Ben and Teddy. So uh, uh, let's have a final kind of word uh, for, for you two. Uh, what, advice for an entrepreneur. Someone watching this might be thinking, you know what? This is another problem I, I have uh, just this sore with. I need to fix um uh, person hasn't done it before they've not had that entrepreneurial path what would you advise uh what advice would you give them that um that you've kind of uh picked up over the time that you've uh, been working with bright high i mean my my lots of advice that i could share but i think the, the one that i think is really important is you should really care about the problem that you're solving um like very fundamentally because there's going to be a lot of ups and downs and so if you don't actually care about the problem that you're solving very deeply, like those will be pretty tough, you know, to get through. Uh, much easier to get through if you feel like you're working on something that's important to you and important, you know, potentially to the world and, and so forth. Um, so, you know, I, it, you're always better off when you're working on a problem that you actually like really care about solving. Uh, yep. So just to summarize there, basically, if, if you're just looking at a flywheel of problems and, you know, you don't care which one, that will not sustain you through the tough times, basically. Um, because there's going to be peaks and there's going to be plenty of troughs and you've got to be able to power through those troughs and the North Star is going to help you do that. If you don't have the North Star, don't do it. Um, okay, Teddy, uh, how about you? Uh, one of our early investors uh, just had one word, courage. That was it. You're going to have to tackle a lot that you've never tackled before. It's going to be hard. Just, you know, have faith in yourself, have courage, get through it, like make forward progress every day and like lean on your team. Like you're not in it by yourself. Like you're in yeah. it with, with your team, with, you know, one of the people who we talked a lot about in this conversation, like our first client, Cody Horton is on this conversation. You know, like you have, you, 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 you derive courage from, from the people that you surround yourself with, your team, your investors, your early customers. Um, that's the most important thing. That's right. And also be aware that you're like advancing on new ground. This is virgin territory. You're exploring new spaces. So inevitably there's discomfort there. It's it's the it's the literal description of exiting a comfort zone. So, you know, that's when you know courage might come to you because all of those feelings that are coming from being out of comfort zone are entirely normal. Um, and you've just got to plow on through. Okay. Yeah. That's about it, everybody. Um, final, final word. Uh, what are you going to be doing after this call? What kind of busy stuff do you have lined up for the rest of the day? Ben, you first. Uh, I'm looking at my phone. Never mind. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five interviews. Wow. Blasting through. Getting usage out of Bright High. <laughs> you know, getting those user numbers up. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. How about you, Teddy? What are you doing? Uh, a new hire onboarding conversation, a prospect call, client call, and an interview. Fantastic. So recruiting all the time. And by the way, fan fan message to anybody watching this. They are recruiting for a, a recruiter, first internal recruiter for Bright Hire. Um, if you've liked the conversation so far and you're intrigued and interested in the product um, and you uh, uh, you value the, the mission that Teddy and Ben are on, this may be a business worth paying attention to. Okay, Ben and Teddy, let me leave you uh, to the rest of your day. Thank you so much for your time. It's been awesome having you on Founders Focus. I um, uh, wish you all the best for your, uh, uh, for your project and your business. Um, obviously, I'm here uh, to, uh, to see and support that journey. So I uh, look forward to seeing your success, guys. Thanks so much, Han. Thanks, Han.